Karl Marx once wrote, Nothing is easier than to give Christianity a socialist tinge. He cites Christian demonization of wealth as a corrupter of men, as well as what he referred to as a similar sacrifice of the self for the sake of the collective that is shared between communism and Christianity. While Marx's belief parallels between Christianity and communism are in most part generalizations, there is a movement of socialist scholars who have gone beyond the veil of Marxism alone to suggest that following Jesus' death, his apostles, along with various other Christian societies after them, practice a system that could be interpreted as a form of ancient communism. Now, you may argue that communism is indisputably anti-clerical, as well as socially incompatible with the moral systems of Christianity. However, these same Christian communist scholars have argued that the anti-religious aspects of communism have been imposed by Marx's personal ideological philosophies and are not core nor necessary to the establishment of a solely economic communist society. So then, what exactly does constitute Christian communism? At its core, it focuses on communal ownership of all possessions, collective labor toward a shared goal, and the upholding of biblical scripture as a means of preventing exploitation by maintaining the word of God as the highest and sole authority among an equal population. Because historically Christian communism couldn't have been heavily industrialized, there is instead a guild-like approach to skilled production, where skilled laborers would be provided the necessary resources to produce sustainable levels of their respective goods, producing as they wish and under their own conditions, so long as they meet a need or surplus quota. In exchange, they receive equal access to the end distribution of all goods. These guildsmen would also fill basic labor roles when their skills weren't needed, in order to ensure that all in the community contributed according to their ability. Christian communism, unlike Marxist communism, is by its nature passive and nonviolent, seeking to establish itself gradually and on the local level, in place of violently seizing power over the whole of resources and production within a state. A Christian communist society is thus less a government which heavily enforces a codified law, and more a communally shared lifestyle in which the followers of Christian communism themselves penalize those who violate the doctrine's virtues or upset the fluid system of their society. Thus, it is in essence more a religious sect than a mere ideology. Today, Christian communism exists only in small pockets around the world, notably in North and South America, confined to small communities and areas. But what if things were different? What if the world saw the principles of Christian communism replace the influence of Marxist philosophy? In this alternate world, let's suppose that the rising secularism and liberalism of the 19th century leads some to fear the emergence of an ideology much like Marx's, a system which attacks the foundations of religion, tradition, and culture, knowing well it would feed into the growing demands among the lower classes for equalization despite the sheer damage it would cause. In the wake of the Communist Manifesto's publication, many critiqued that it was nothing but inflammatory words meant to appeal to and radicalize egalitarian sentiment of the time. Moreover, that it was a phrase book for men seeking to merely exploit the anger of the peasants for their own gain, something the subsequent Bolshevik and Chinese revolutions would demonstrate vividly, having replaced the old establishment elites with new ones at the cost of much blood, both poor and rich. Thus, in this world is created a new manifesto, an act near paralleling Martin Luther's posting of the 95 Theses. In it, Europe is served a critique of both modern exploitative elitist practices, as well as liberal egalitarian naivism. God and faith are placed in center focus as the noblest of goods, and the benevolent force sure to save the downtrodden worker from the manipulative hands of big business and unscrupulous unions. While it's unlikely to be directly and widely accepted by the church, the popular phrases and philosophies of the manifesto may gradually find themselves intertwined within the church culture of the day, triggering a light schism between the church's more economically left-wing elements and those of a more conservative stance. In essence, fracturing Christendom of the day along political lines. This ideology would also mesh better with the popular prodonist anarchists of the time than Marxist communism ever had, being that Prodone advocated for a peaceful revolution and favored the ideal of a communal or cooperative ownership instead of nationalization. Even his slogan, Order Without Power, would ring well in tune with the philosophies of the Christian communists. Prodone is significant because before the rise of Marx, he held seat as perhaps the radical left's chief representative figure, inspiring the rise of numerous anarchist movements across Europe and later the world over. Marx and Prodone's ideological followers clashed hard in our timeline, and while initially the two attempted to find common ground, the flag of the Reds and the Blacks was eventually torn in two. This world, without the destructive anger of Marxism, sees anarchism and communism gradually merge into a far larger movement over the course of years. Not only reaching a wider crowd of less radical men simply seeking a better work environment, but also bridging the gaps within the left itself. Atheism, while more common among the left in the modern day, was not as widespread among the old left, especially outside of Marxist circles. Many still held close their beliefs and at times some even felt conflicted by their loyalty to God and the ideology. 
In this world, faith and leftism have synergistically merged into a system that could truly thrive in these times. The newly introduced Christian element of the left diminishes much of the fears which would have surrounded it, as well as diminishes many of the violent actions which would have painted an unattractive image of the radical left, who at the time in large part simply wanted to remove itself from what it felt was a system of exploitation. This universal double down of peaceful progress would further inspire goodwill between the left and right for the sake of reaching compromise. The American 1890s and early decade of the 1900s saw the US government take a stand against monopolistic and unsavory business practices. It was an essential social movement of the time to expose exploitation and infringements of both workers and public rights. Out of this period would emerge various strikes, exposés, and acts to reform American business to meet a better standard. But strikes and protests didn't always solve the problems of the worker, and a good number were still unsatisfied with their lot. A better solution was thus needed. Whereas in our world, desperate anarchists and socialists began to adopt the more violent tendencies advocated by Marx in hopes of forcing change, in this world, social pressures felt within the working class are gradually released through the legalization and popular establishment of Christian communes. See, it was clear to some at the time that there was no clean solution to the problem presented by underhanded business. You could outlaw them, break them up as you'd like, and successfully reduce their power, but seemingly so long as greed and deception exists, so will men find new ways to cheat the system. At least, that's how some might perceive it. And to that sum, it is unfair to impose but that one option of existence, an essential monopoly of lifestyle. Of course, that's not how it was seen in our world. We just wanted to take our system and try to fix it to be as good for Group A as it was for Group B. But that doesn't always work. Compromise sometimes fixes no problems and just upsets both sides. This time, things are different. This period saw great efforts for social reforms, especially for workers, but things were only going to go so far. Anarchism and communism as political parties and systems would never gain overwhelming support. However, as a political religious group, something just as successful could be achieved. The first years of the 1900s sees the Christian communists, with the support of various labor unions, anarchists, and socialist organizations, take a matter all the way to the Supreme Court. The matter that it is unconstitutional and a violation of the First Amendment to impose capitalism upon a religious group for whom it violates their beliefs. The resolution is made in a decade-defining verdict. Just as the Amish shun technology and the Quakers shun violence, so for the Christ communists must a government exception be made for a lifestyle free of capitalism. Enter the rise of communist sanctuaries. Provided land by the American government to ensure the Christ communists' freedom of religion is preserved to the letter within enclaves they can call their own and practice their beliefs in as they see fit. Around the globe, this is championed as a major win for the political left, inspiring a migration of international socialists, anarchists, and communists to these new sanctuaries. And with the protective oversight of the US government, they actually thrive. Life within the communes is remarkably simpler and modest, both as a product of less demanding production quotas, as well as modest Christian doctrine. A lack of external threat and assurance of security allows occupants of the commune to function without need for hierarchy or direct leadership outside of religious guidance. A strong sense of community and brotherhood is fostered to prevent sloth and general abuse of the system. Those who do abuse the system repeatedly will find themselves ostracized and even exiled from the community, removing detrimental elements from the commune without the need for bloodshed. As a religious group, the Christ Communists would be free of taxation and any governmental infringement of their local policies, though as a repeated show of thanks in the name of charity, a donation of surplus crop and production could be allocated to neighboring communities at the end of each distribution cycle. Businesses seeing that they may be at great risk of losing workers are forced to compete for employees and make employment a more attractive prospect to communal living, doing this by improving their own standards and offering better payment. Supply of workers drops, and thus demand goes up. Internationally, the impact of the Christian communist movement would almost certainly siphon away any momentum from the more radical and aggressive left-wing groups, as through persistent advocacy for an achievement of a mutual solution, there is little support for the radical words of men bent on violence. There was no more need to shed blood for revolution, because the revolution had already been achieved. The success of the experiment in the US inspires similar pushes throughout North America and Europe. Some see it as a terrific compromise to appease a volatile and unruly group, Others, of course, view it as a surrender to unrealistic demands. However, from a historical perspective, the period may well come down to form the basis of a new enlightenment, a revolution in workers' rights successfully achieved without a drop of blood spilt. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.